So, uh, given the the bold announcement from Airbus yesterday, Christian is is uh, in here as well. So this this should be the spin out spin in topic should be a very exciting one, <laughs> and uh, uh, in particular, so we have Christian uh, uh, as part of our our uh, panel here, and um, yeah, let's let's start off with uh, with some basics. So I mean, uh, th there is a long standing question. I've been uh, discussing frequently over, over and over with companies. So um, what is the best way to innovate, to build business in a corporate setting? Is it inside the company, or outside the company? So, and um, um, I think either approach has, has its pros and cons, uh, as, as you can see here. Um, for example, the inside approach um, gives a company ownership and control, which is sometimes indicated. Integration with a core business is certainly um, a little bit tighter. On, on the other hand, if you go outside, uh, you will have much more autonomy and, and leeway for decision, as well as, as speed as you can uh, circumvent all the corporate guidelines and, and politics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, there are there are proponent, proponents to each approach, and um, you can also find uh, popular examples for each approach. For example, Hilti here, which is nearby my hometown in Switzerland, uh, built its its fleet management model uh, uh, internally, right, um, as well as Rolls Royce. Um, with their power by the hour business model, and last but not least. Um, BP Launchpad, the venture builder um, from BP, is also an internal uh, venture builder. Yeah? And uh, on the outside approach, you have Nestle, for example, Nespresso, you all know, uh, was spun out from Nestle. Netflix spun out Roku, formerly Netflix Box. And a very popular example in, from Germany is the, the, the Daimler, Daimler uh, formerly Lab 1886. Now it's called 1886 Ventures, which was spun out from the corporation. And to cite uh, Susanne Hahn, the managing director from, from, the, from, the, from the entity, uh, she said, you, you cannot scale uh, uh, ventures that particularly if they go beyond the core inside a corporate setting. So you have to go outside. So she's a clear proponent, proponent for the outside approach. So, and what I have come to realize um, over the time by, by working with, uh, with uh, several companies is that each company has an individual, I call this un uncertainty, uh, uncertainty uh, threshold beyond which the company hesitates or, or sometimes declines to invest in, in innovation and corporate ventures internally. And uh, the... The, the, the interesting thing is that um, research uh, or, or pretty new research has shown that this, this threshold um, is, is narrowing at the moment. So um, the trend is that, that, that corporates tend to promote innovation activities and venturing activities that are closer to the core. And in particular, scaling where you need a lot of resources financially, but also personnel, um, are, are very hard to, let's say, pursue in an inside approach um, if they, let's say, reach beyond this, this uncertainty threshold. So there is just um, the, the option to, to go outside yeah, if, you, if you reach beyond. That's what I learned, um, at least. So, and, and I also, uh, condensed, let's say, a set of criteria along which ventures should be, uh, let's say, evaluated in order to assess whether to pick an, an inside approach or, or rather an outside approach. For example, let, we, we can quickly go through them. Um, the first is, is uncertainty is, um, as to foreseeable contribution to core business. So does the venture actually contribute to the core business in a, in a financial or even transformational way. If, if the, the uncertainty is high, you probably would pick an outside approach. If it's moderate or even low, you, you can think about an inside approach. The next important one is uh, relevance to, to strategy. Yeah, if there is no 
uh, or a low relevance to the current corporate strategy. And I think um, uh, Christian also mentioned it yesterday um, uh, in his, his announcement of, of Airbus Space. Then it's very hard to, um, let's say, build technologies or business models uh, inside a company. So you, you have to either skip them or, or pick an, an outside approach. Uh, foreseeable conflict uh, potential to core business. For example, if you have a disruptive business model that, that, that highly or is, is supposed to disrupt the core business, it's very hard to, to drive this internally, of course. Regulatory or political risks is, a, is an issue. So that, that's a major reason why, for example, healthcare ventures or, or fintech ventures are um, largely um, built outside the, the, the corporations. And last but not least, access to required resources, competences, and capabilities that you need to, to build those ventures and to scale them. If, if, you, if you have um, no access or if it's unclear to get access to these, these uh, assets, you might uh, favor to go outside uh, and, and hire them from the, from the market there instead of going internally. I think this is, these are, is a condensed set of, of uh, criteria that, that could uh, give you an indication whether to pick an inside approach or outside approach. So, but the point actually is um, maybe you, you, you shouldn't choose or, or between either inside or outside. Maybe there is also a solution to combine both approaches. And that what leads to uh, what we call spin outs, spin in. And the idea is here uh, basically, so if you go along those set of criteria and you decide on, on, on spinning out the venture to, to go outside and, and, and grow it outside, then uh, you, you also, let's say, reduce the corporate involvement. And usually the, the corporate then takes a, a minority stake in some way. Um, it's it's still involved, but it, it hands over the, the the main activities to the, the venture itself or, or or some external partner. So the 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 venture can now grow on its own, more or less uh, outside the company, and at some appropriate time, you could think of spinning it in again if there is some some fit according to the, to the set of criteria, or at least some of them. Um, the prerequisite is here that you have to, to negotiate uh, with, a, with a cap table of the, of the, the, the spun out venture, a kind of call option that you can do this. And this is, this is the, the requirement. This, this approach is not new, basically. There is a very prominent example, uh, which is Cisco. So Cisco actually, a spun out, spun in three uh, different ventures with the same group of founders. So in a repeatable way, and, and it, it, it worked out. So the, the CEO at that time clearly mentioned that um, structural wise, um, it's a superior, superior approach. It was, uh, let's say, dismissed uh, after some time in Cisco for, for other reasons. Uh, um, but uh, actually, it, it, it has worked, yeah. And uh, there is some objection uh, which, which concerns the, the integration. As we all know, if you try to acquire startups and, and uh, um, aimed to, to integrate them in a corporate, so the, the rate of failure is very, very high. I think uh, close to 80, 80% or even more. So this is an objection, but there is some interesting research which says that if you, let's say, um, found a venture inside a, um, a corporation, and uh, let's say it's founded by a former employee, this employee can later, after spinning the, the venture in again, uh, can leverage uh, his or her empl employment ties. So a kind of network which makes it easier for for the for the for the venture to to become integrated in the in the, in the corporate network again. So this is uh, maybe something um, 
to, to, to look at. Um, so how could, could this, this spin out spin in approach be, be implemented? And um, I've, I've been discussing this with, with uh, Manfred for, for quite some time now. And we, we, we came to conclude that an optimal way is to really combine internal and external business building. So I, want, want, I don't want to, to go in too much detail here. I mean, you can, you can see the visual is, is uh, maybe a little bit complex, but the, the main idea here is um, to leverage both inside and outside approaches uh, to, to business building um, comes down to establishing an, an internal unit here as part of the, the explorative innovation activities, which let's say is in charge or which drives the, let's call it close to core innovation, uh, which after it, it has been grown to some extent can be scaled up and transitioned into the into the core business uh, in one way or the other, yeah? either as a new business line in an existing business unit or uh, as, a, as a completely new business unit. Um, in contrast, um, we, we also suggest um, establishing an external business building, which ideally involves collaboration with, with external partners such as a an, an, an startup studio or an external venture building builder like, like Mantra, for example, but also a, um, a financing partner in order to, uh, let's say, gather the financial resources with, which are needed uh, to really scale a venture up to a significant size. So, and uh, so, um, this would be a completely new setup. And, and um, what is particularly important is that in both, let's say, um, both approaches, the internal and the external one, um, the, the corporate has to make sure that it provides an optimal, let's say, business building environment that the, that the, the ventures can really grow. So, and this is, um, let's say, can be internally a kind of corporate venture unit or a kind of venture builder internally, like, like BP Launchpad, for example. And this, this can be a, a external business building partner um, like, like Mantro um, in, in the external case. And uh, what it comes down to is that the interplay between the internal and the external uh, business building um, um, is, 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 is effective and um, and um, complementary, so to speak. Uh, and how this will be implemented uh, more in detail, uh, we'll, we'll explain Manfred now, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to hand over to him, so. Thank you, Ralph. Manfred. Thank you, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, um, so. Um, yeah. Maybe you can stop sharing, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, um, in general, yeah, talking about the approach and how to implement it, I think one thing that that everybody needs to have in mind from the corporate perspective is which role is is the corporate playing when in this venture journey, yeah. And I think one thing that is quite important is that this role can change over time. That's why it's also so um, so interesting to look at the spin out, spin in approach, because. In general, it says something about how do you behave as an exploration unit or a business unit to, uh, talking about venturing when you're looking at uh, venture activities. Um, so what we see a lot in our activities is that basically when we start out, no matter if it's a, a spin out of technology, if it's a, a new foundation of a new venture, a new business model, whatever, um, independent on the ownership, on the organizational structure, the best way to behave for the corporate is basically as a financial investor, as an early stage financial investor. So um, get into the second line and let the people work in, in simple words. Yeah. So because early stage products, early stage business models are not strong enough or not, not, uh, not mature enough to actually work in a corporate context. 
what comes afterwards, as soon as this thing is through, before you actually spin in a company again, before you say it's core business, there is a medium stage. And I think um, Chris uh, trained that a lot in his previous job with Vira, where they really made use of the so-called um, venture client model. So even though you are maybe the owner of a venture, if you have the, the investor, the financier, um, you should look and try to set up a, a venture client mode and bring this technology in into the core and make use of it in your core business. Because if you never prove that something is relevant for the core business, for the existing organization, it will always be pushed away. Yeah, so no matter how much sense it makes from a business case perspective, there needs to be an attachment to the core business. There needs to be valid value that you put in. And from talking on a practical side, there are basically five perspectives um, we always discuss in each shareholder meetings with all our corporate partners. And we always say there is there's just a metric about um, three um, three levels that you can achieve for um, when you're looking at a business model, you're asking yourself, what about the customers? What about technology, skills, channels, and partners? Those are the five perspectives. And we always say for each perspective, how close is it right now, what we're doing in this business model to the existing core business? And this can change over time. And I'll give you a concrete example when talking about customers. Um, close to the current business would be in a B2B business model, for example, same customers and same personas at, at the customers I'm talking to. Um, what is in the second level would be same customer with this different buying persona at a customer. It's a completely different thing. For example, we have one joint venture with Audi where we're not selling cars, we're selling a software as a service mobility budget. It's also for fleet customers, but we're selling it to the HR department which a completely different buying persona, they buy completely differently. Is this now strategically relevant? Yes or no? That's an interesting question. And this changed over time. Yeah. So the third level would be, it's completely far away from the current core business. It's new customers, new personas. I have nothing to do with it. And when you go through all those five perspectives and you're just talking about that for half an hour, you basically find out what should I do next with this business model? Is this just an investment for me? Is this far away from the core business? And I feel that I would be a financial investor. Should I create a setup like ever scale that is open for external investors where others can get in because I won't take majority in the thing. It's for me, it's more or less a financial case where I get access to technology or talent, for example. Or is this something that I should start spinning in where I should start for example, as mentioned earlier, working with a venture client model to bring my own uh, business units up to speed with this product, include introduce it to my sales process or whatever. Yeah. In the Audi example, what's happened now, two years after we started in the market, the salespeople take it with them because the market says, hmm, I have so many customers, so many employees that don't want to have a company car, don't you have an alternative? And now they're saying, this is interesting. Two years ago, nobody cared about it. All right? So this, this just grew over time. This was a transition of the business model. And when we're talking about spin out, spin in, it's not so much a distincting point of time that you say, okay, I'm taking out a business model for two years, then it grows with some consultancy, with some venture builder or whatever. And then I definitely take it in. Yeah. The thing is, by spinning it out, you get the flexibility to make that decision in the future or make a different decision. And I think that's very important to say as a corporate, by spinning out a venture, try to get a, a flexible model where you can start deciding in a journey what to do with a certain venture. And that's your basic role, coming from a financial investor, introducing it through venture client, and in the best case, spin it in through a typical M&A transaction where you put it in. And um, maybe also that's a good point to, to for, hand over to Chris, because that's one of the thoughts also behind the scale, as I know, and um, maybe Chris. Maybe. Manfred, maybe before yeah. going on with, with Chris, as I don't see a lot of activity in the, everybody's sleeping, I don't know, in, in the chat, no, I'm sure because they are listening, but do not hesitate to put questions in the, in the, in the chat. And even now, before going on, if, if someone has a question, do not hesitate to switch on your mic and, and ask the question before forgetting the first, the first speeches. 
We will have the Q&A at the end, but if you want to make any question now, do not hesitate to do it. <laughs> Somebody says I was provoking. It was a provocation, not sleeping, exciting. Yes. <laughs> it was just to check, to check it out. No, no question now. So we go on with Chris. Are you sure? I don't see anybody unmute the mic. No. Let's so, let's go. Let's go. Let's, let's go, go ahead. I mean, yes. let's go on. Um, and um, I mean, all all, all right. What uh, what uh, Mani and uh, Ralph then uh, said before. Um, obviously, then the 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 challenges lie in the in the little details, right? So um, I mean, for us, it took us um, only eighteen months to design. Um, this uh, this new unit, right? Some would say this is uh, rather fast, and then uh, in a corporate environment, um, because you have to respect kind of the whole all of the all of the little details, right? What happens if you have something um, that you can spin off? Uh, is it strategic? Is it not, right? I mean, the the things money said before, if it's uh, too strategic, uh, you would always want to spin it in, right? Um, and uh, if you then if you see that it's adjacent or a new business. Um, how do you spin it off at the end? I mean, if you if you just put it out um, and still pay the, the the guys, the corporate guys, the the salaries, um, then it's worth uh, worth nothing because they would want to have ownership. So these are all things we need to go through all the all the functions, um, HR and legal and IP, to really sort all that all that out. And that is something that um, Airbus has not been doing very clean the last uh, the last years i mean they did some things and um airbus per se i mean it is a very innovative company right uh, it is it is within the company um but um then really spinning off things it not, it's not something that um that um yeah, yeah. that they used to so we needed to sort all that all, the, all those uh, things out and uh, one one clear um key um milestone there was to agree on minority uh, shareholding conditions, for example. So if we spin something out, um, Airbus um, learns to be a very good uh, minority shareholder. Um, the founders get a part of it, and you also have um, some employee stock options to hire the best people, right? So these are very, very new things um, to, to hand over the control. Um, but I would say you need to decide between growth and control. Um, but Airbus scale, we decided for, for growth. Um, to then launch them them externally, so that is that is a mechanism that needs to be sorted out internally a lot. Um, afterwards, you can find a repeatable model for it. It is an art, but uh, we have people here um, among us who do this in a in a very repeatable way. Um, and the other thing that we that we're still doing, I mean, um, also Mani mentioned that the venture clienting. Um, I mean, before with uh, with Telefonica and they. I think I saw Susanna also in the audience. She can tell a story or two about how Telefonica does this because they have exceptionally uh, with uh, with WIDA, not because I was there, um, I mean, also, um, but uh, they have found a very good and proven uh, concept on, on how to do it, right? Maximizing the volume of startups and getting them really quick into uh, the company and then uh, bringing more to the table than just uh, capital. Right, the startups will not come for the money, but they will come for assets. Um, Telefonica having data assets, having platforms, um, Airbus having technological assets, having um, aircrafts actually that that fly where you can test stuff. Um, so these are valuable assets the corporate can bring um, to the table when uh, when investing into into those teams. Um, and I think that's a crucial part. And it's also I mean, yesterday with launching Airbus Scale, the company builder, we also marked the end to the accelerator. Um, phase. I think um, many of the corporates have gone through those um, vehicles. They have not been proven to be very, very fruitful. Um, rather, working internally on getting startups in fast and working um, on things that are chasing new business outside of the business because the processes of the structures of the corporate are just not made um, to do so. And then you might find a vehicle um, you can put there um, as, a, as a proxy of a, of a startup. I mean, game changing for for our industry certainly was uh, the big uh, investments being made last year in uh, aerospace companies like Lilium, Archer, um, Vertical, Ezer Aerospace raising 60 million euros. So the entry barrier for aerospace, which um, long was very high, is just not uh, not high anymore. So incumbents are getting nervous, and with these new vehicles, um, the aerospace market is hot. 
the new space market is hot. Um, so we need to find a way to to spin out um, those things. So that's my two cents, and I'm not sure if this guy is just too loud um, and annoying you all. Um, it's annoying me, but um, be happy to answer any any questions. Thank you, Chris. Yes, we have a first question from Klaus. Uh, I will read it in the chat. I, I wonder what the spin out spinning approach does with the people. If I spin out, I attract very different people compared to staying inside the corporation. Is there any hope to keep the people if I later spin it again? Spin it in again. Can, can I have that? So um yeah. I mean, actually, if you spin out, you don't, you, you, you're not necessarily want to have those, um, those uh, people, right? Because, um, and here's a real life, life example. We had a project um, which we wanted to spin out and we had a hundred uh, people saying like, okay, you, you're going you're gonna to leave this company. You're going to become CEO of this company, but you're going to leave your company car and your parking lot here and your pension plan, right? From hundred people to then decided we need to go. And that's the kind of species you you want to have, uh, not the risk averse ones, but the risk takers. Um, and yes, it's a very different skill set you need there, right? Because um, people from inside are normally very very complacent, and um, and doing something internally is fun for some time. But if you really spin it out, uh, you you need to have skill in the game. That's my two two cents on it. I'd like to oh. maybe extend on that because um, again, for me, it's a time of where you are in your venture journey. Yeah, when you're actually introducing a, a business into your core world, it is so mature that um, this, this might be, I don't know, 300, 400 people in this legal organization before you actually spin it in, yeah, before you get in. So it, it doesn't make sense for a corporate to have a very early stage business model in the corporate within in the first week, but also not after two years. It just doesn't make sense. It's still a very young organization. It's still very fluent and very, very yeah different kind of people. When it's grown up, when it's mature, it's, when it's really proving value, then this is also a quite mature organization. And from, um, from classical M&A approaches, when people buy smaller companies, it's not like everybody is leaving next week. Right? So this is, this is just keep in mind when you are actually doing the spin in and what type of people are there in the company then. It's, pretty, it's maybe also a good way to, to boost intra intrapreneurship in the company when they come back and you spin in again, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe adding some thoughts to what, what Chris and, and, and Mani just said. I mean, first, um, in in some um, in some cases or in many cases you go outside to hire external talent because you cannot acquire the te uh, talent internally, uh, especially in in the digital area or software area. So you 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 uh, on purpose you go outside because you cannot uh, acquire the the appropriate profiles internally. So this this is this is one reason. Um, then maybe uh, to the to the question. I mean, there there is a there's a critical issue um, with respect to incentivization. So as we all know, incentivization in in a corporate is completely different than in a startup. And if you, as a founder team, uh, are are uh, are being spun out, and you let's say. Um, Take some shares of the of this new venture, and the, and the venture is growing, and you you are participated, and uh, it, it 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 scales, and later you you spin it in again in a, in a corporate. Then of course, and this this was also the the case uh, with uh, Cisco. Then you um, I mean you earn a lot of money, uh, more money than uh, than the corporate guys do, and there is then there might be some envy in the corporate. And that this was the major reason why uh, Cisco dismissed the, the, the spin out, spin in approach, because the culture was not ready for this uh, structurally strong approach. And so um, bottom line, we have to have a, a certain, maybe a certain maturity within a corporate to employ 
this approach effectively and without conflict. Yeah, this is uh, this is important. Correct, Thank and you, um, yeah, and then maybe maybe two cents on this. I mean, and, and there's no there's no good and bad, right? I mean, the the, the corporate works like a corporate. Business. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be um, resilient. Um, I mean, in the in the context of Airbus, we build aircrafts, right? You cannot fail fast there. Um, you should not be experimenting with uh, with life. So it works to operate. It's built to operate, and uh, then to discover, to explore, um, to to do something new. Um, you need a very different uh, skill set, and that's what also Ralph you always talk as an ambidextrous organization, one foot in the business, one foot outside. I think only in that in that symbiosis it uh, it really makes sense. And um, if you if you think you're on, on running an innovation unit, okay, we have more questions now. Uh, uh, I have a question from Kenosi. If you want to open open your mic, you can do it. Otherwise, I will I will, I will read your question in the chat. Kenosi. Hi everyone. Um, I've got two questions actually. So the word question has to do with like if you're spinning in a a team a business into a, a, an existing business, uh, when does, does it not affect the growth prospect of that business? So, because now you had this team that were focused on thinking about things differently, and now you've got a new team that may be taking over, and they may not necessarily see things the same way or be able to defend the business. How, uh, how does that actually get managed to ensure that it's not gonna just die when it actually gets spun in? Um, yeah, I think that that was my my my, my recent question. Just with a, which is basically the other one is actually linked. The other question, whether you actually entails like when you hand over the business, it entails giving to the core, so you can actually focus on building new businesses. Uh, so that those are the the, the, the questions I'm just having uh, listening to you. Thanks. In, in maybe let me answer that. In my opinion, this is a completely theoretical problem to be honest. Yeah, so this is coming from an HR organization perspective. When you when you're talking about a spin in basically this is a, a legal entity that you put into somewhere else where a new team is built up, where you what you're actually doing is a merger and acquisition process where you buy a new company. It's not like you're you're buying IP customers and operations you throw away all the people and other people take over the project. This is this is not what's happening. You're integrating an existing team. Yeah. So it's not like you're taking it away from the people that have been doing it and the losses that you're just talking about. So and all the it's not a, so what happens, for example, when a company is acquired, you will always say there is a freezing period or a vesting period of two years for the people to stay in before you let them actually leave or something to uh, make sure that operations continue working. Yeah, so there are tools and always think of the thing like a completely external acquisition. And what would you do there? And then you get out of this, this mode. And I um, maybe there was another very uh, interesting question. Um, Philip, if you're if you're right with that, I will take it over. Because Jörg asked where do companies, corporates typically fail and what factors do they neglect? Yeah, and and I think that this is this is one of the core things. Um, when you're talking about venture activities and um, and what when you read the press release of, of Airbus yesterday, maybe yeah, they said they take technology out and they make it investable for other investors. So they're making it attractive to the capital market. The thing behind this is that, and I think what is what is very um, amazing in that step is that a corporate that is normally measured with KPIs like revenue, sales performance, EBIT, and so on, is for the first time taking a equity value approach, which is something completely different. Yeah, You're talking equity value versus EBIT versus uh, revenue and so on. And I think that's the major thing where corporates really fail in doing venture, venturing in general, when you're talking about especially digital business model, new tech and so on, it's about revenue multiples. Yeah, it's about equity value, how, how those things are, are, are valued. But this is not introduced in, in normal management of, of venture or innovation activities. It's always a, when do you make revenue? When do you make EBIT? And so on, yeah. And as soon as you open up to external investment investors, you're taking a, an equity value decision, yeah. And you're making taking an equity value road. And I think this this is so important, and this is what is what is interesting in the approach that Airbus actually did, or uh, what's happening. They they are 
actually willing to pay more for spinning it in again because they are de-risking in the early stage and they are willing to accept equity value. Yeah, so if something turns out to be successful, if other investors come in, those people will want to have their money and their profit back. So when Airbus in the future, in 10 years, decides this technology needs to be integrated into Airbus, they will have to pay market price for that. And to make this, this decision with the clear mind always holds back corporates because they say, ah, why should I pay so much in the future for something that I started? Yeah, because you wouldn't build it into the end. Yeah, you wouldn't invest like 300 million into Lilium or whatever. Yeah, you wouldn't do it because it's always in your portfolio. It would be too risky to take this one step. But de-risking in the beginning, spinning it out in the beginning makes it more expensive in the future. But the certainty of being successful at all is still much higher. Yeah, and if you then include your equity value for the thing you already have shares in and so on. And this is what makes a, a, a structured approach like Everscale successful. Mm -hmm. And you, to, to give a little bit of yeah. just one, one background to this one, because it was an interesting part of it. Um, you, you need smart people on the top that understand exactly this mechanism here, right? That you trade, that you're doing trades actually. And uh, this, this came actually to quote uh, out of the discussions we had with our CFO, Dominic, who came from, from Infineon actually, so he knows the mechanism of, of spinning off because Infineon is a spin-off from Siemens. Um, but he said something very valuable, which was I'd rather have 30% of something valuable than 100% of something that's worth nothing. Um, so that's that's what's, uh, what's so special about Airbus, that it produces so much technology that is valuable for the outside market rather than for the product. And to understand that, and I would say that um, maybe 60, 70% of German companies are probably R&D heavy, and we can take the same approach uh, there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, Kenosi. Chris mentioned yeah. before Susanna from, from Telefonica. So, Susanna, if you, you want to unmute. Yeah, sure. Nice. Sorry. Nice to see you here. Nah. Hi, thanks. Uh, so basically, uh, we have, I, I would dare say, both approaches because we do have like the internal uh, corporate venture. And actually, uh, uh, Ralph, uh, we have discussed with Ralph a lot about uh, scaling <laughs> internal ventures in, in our group. And in that particular case, for example, Chris mentioned the assets. And in, in our case, it's very important that uh, the ventures that are created are based on any of our assets, the assets we have. They could be data or distribution channels or technology, our network, whatever, because it gives us a sustainable advantage. So it, it's a key point for us there. But we also have our investment vehicles for, for startups. Um, and uh, we have several investment vehicles, actually, uh, depending on the on the ticket and depending also on the maturity. So uh, if we consider the, the biggest ticket and the, uh, the maturity of the startups we invest in that are uh, mainly scale ups and, and so on, we have telephonic ventures and fans that are more kind of a strategic investment for uh, for um, challenges we have in the telco industry and we want to leverage on each um, uh, and, and on each technologies then we have uh, the wire hubs so the ticket is lower and the maturity is basically uh, helping the startups to scale and uh, those those hubs are uh, in Europe and Latin America in several several countries where we are present. Then we have WireX that was created last year. And this is uh, for startups that are in an early stage, seedbed, uh, early stage startups that are basically 100% uh, uh, digital and they could be anywhere in any part of the world. Uh, and focus, we are focusing on mass market for this, for this particular uh, investment vehicle. And uh, then we have, uh, we created like one year and a half our Wira Builder that is for creating our own startups. So there are some technologies and some uh, uh, internal technologies that we have, or maybe products that don't make sense for Telefonica um, uh, as an internal product or as an internal technology, but it does make sense to create a startup. Uh, 
So actually, uh, we already have uh, created some startups there. We are also looking also now for ideas, you know, they are outside as well. So it's not only uh, creating ventures that way. And and things that have happened also, we had the, our alpha that it was like our moonshot factory. And one of the moonshots, this was quite recent, well, quite recently, some months ago, actually, we, we did a spin-off of one of these moonshots and created us and created a startup that uh, is uh, is also invested by us but by other investors as well so um I, I don't i don't want to speak more because i could be talking a lot of time but maybe this can give you an idea of all the all the um different vehicles we have uh, telefonica for uh well what what our approach looks like thank you susana I, Rafael, I you, you raised your hand before. Yeah, you want to, to add something, Raf? Yeah, I would like I'd like to add something to Susanna. So uh, thank you for, for uh, um, let's say, uh, listing all, all the vehicles. And I think you make, 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 a, make a great point. Um, I think it's important to have various vehicles in place for different scopes. And uh, as you all know, I'm, a, let's say, a proponent of what I call dual innovation. And, and the, 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 the the, the major failure of companies um, I see is that most of the time companies, let's say, operate ventures in the wrong vehicle. And I, I roughly distinguish between uh, in core and beyond core. Uh, and uh, this is also related to, to inside and outside. So if you, if you have an, uh, a venture related to the core, you can surely leverage assets. You, you need a vehicle that makes sure that you can leverage assets like, like the existing data, existing sales channels, et cetera, et cetera. But once you go beyond the core, you, you don't have this connection uh, as much. So you, you, you need different mechanisms, you need different people, uh, you need, need a higher autonomy uh, and so on. To, to grow those ventures. And then maybe, um, yeah, companies need to start distinguishing those different vehicles or systems. And then they, uh, in my opinion, they would be would be more successful in venturing and innovation. Thank yeah, you, and, uh, actually Chris mentioned it that, I, that we have, uh, corporates have um, not only uh, investment capabil capability, but also the, the a way to provide something else to the startups in general, internal or external, that is our assets. And some of our assets, for example, are also our partners. So in our case, for example, our startups, we have activation programs where they can get access to our partners as well to, to, to leverage them and, and of course our customers. Yeah, uh, And also something that in our case, we are in several countries. So basically it's also a way to expand. If you invest in a startup that is based in Germany, for example, but that startup wants to expand to other geographies, uh, you, we can help them do that because we are present in several countries. So that's, the, I mean, the assets part that Chris mentioned, I think it's it's very important as well. Thank you, Susanna. Sorry, Rafael, I shut up. Raised, don't worry, don't worry. It's just that we still have three minutes and we have a couple of, of, of questions waiting there. So we will try to to go and to give quick answers. Rafael, no, it's your turn. You raised your, your hand before. You're still there. You're, you're on mute, Rafael. I don't know if you hear me. Otherwise, I go first to the uh, to another question. Or at you, uh, you said, yeah, and, and maybe you want to unmute and ask the question by yourself. No, otherwise, uh, yeah. Okay, so so I'm I'm asking. My question is: if um, the project continues, gets out of that exploratory validation zone, and but the people will not because everybody is saying that you need different kind of profiles, right? How would you get? Uh, existing employees engagement to work for another project. Either you can build an exploratory teams that will take ideas and, and you know, focus to explore and then hand it over. But like that, you cannot scale other benefits of, of an innovation or of an incubator uh, lab, for example, uh, scaling the culture, learnings, uh, Right. So my question is, doesn't this bring the motivation if the project will continue, but the people will not? 
maybe I can answer on that because I built an organization that is maybe not part of a corporate, but um, you know, the problem with corporate innovation units is that you're actually not successful in your career if you build a successful startup. True. Just, just think about that for a second. Yeah. So, um, when you, you always corporates compare their innovation thing like with the startup world, people want to be engaged, and yeah, they need to call it your own entrepreneurship, ownership, or whatever. But um, the career path definitely says you shouldn't be the owner of a venture for too long, especially not when it gets to this to this uh, time after two to three years when it's just very stressful and not so uh, is successful for that particular time. You shouldn't be there. So, and um, well, I, I would rephrase the question, what do I need to do? How do I need to incentivize? How do I need to change my model of innovation to make it uh, a real goal for the people involved to stick with the venture and to go that path? Because that would be the, the you know, the best case would be that the people that start with something that are really involved, that feel that this is their own baby, stick with the thing and do it. And this should be equal to have career success in a corporate environment. And this is, if you're honest, in like every corporate innovation unit I've seen, these are two completely different paths. Yeah, so innovation is done by people. Innovation is done by people that are, and you, you hear all those stuff when you talk about entrepreneurship programs and so on. Hey, I want to be have you entrepreneurial thinking. I want to have your go out of your comfort zone and so on. But you're actually not really awarding people to go out of the comfort zone because they should stick either with the innovation unit and do something different, like you said. Yeah, which is... Also, again, from an HR perspective, it makes sense because you think you would lose the learning. But to be economically successful, you should have an incentive model where people that have something really stick with the thing and go in there and have the, their best possible career approach if they bring something to an end. Thank you, Manfred. Manfred, uh, I see the time is out. We are one minute uh, after the, the timing. So what I propose, we, we still have a couple of questions. So what I propose is to, to go on, for example, uh, Gerard, Gerard to put it on the community platform and we could continue. Maybe Austin, maybe you can uh, post us the, uh, the link on the, on the chat to go on, on the, to, to be able to go and continue discussion uh, at another moment on the community platform. And then Austin will we'll also put the link to the next uh, presentation that will start in, uh, in nine minutes now. So thanks, thanks a lot, Chris, Ralph, and Manfred. Very interesting uh, presentation. A lot of good questions and good interactions also. So I think it's really bringing value for a lot of uh, people involved in uh, innovation and ventures and, and startups and spin-offs. So thank you, everybody. Great discussion today. And uh, see you on the, on the community platform where you can go on with the, the, with the discussion. And yes, I see the link is already there. You see Austin posted already the, uh, the first link and maybe you can post also the link to the, next, uh, to the next presentation, but we have time. We have eight minutes before the next uh, presentation is starting. So thank you everybody. And uh, hope to see you soon, at least on the community platform and maybe also on other presentation online. Thank you. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you for moderating, Philip. Thank bye you bye. all for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you.